I'm Chris Newfield. I teach in the English department at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I write about higher education policy and, among other things, student debt. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of wrecking the public benefits of higher education slowly but surely. Uh, graduate student debt is sloppily modeled on undergraduate student debt. And the underlying theory of why it's okay for undergraduates to take on a bunch of personal debt in order to get a bachelor's degree is, I think, fundamentally flawed. It, the idea is that a bachelor's degree is basically a private good. You're investing in your own future market value uh, as a you know, little human capital, as Wendy Brown calls it in her book, Undoing the Demos. And so what that means is you're... Going to university is essentially uh, uh, an investment that you're going to get a calculable, estimable return on. So all that's happening in the beginning is you're taking out debt to invest in yourself, and the, reward, the returns are going to allow you to pay back that debt. And there are books that show that the return on investment for going to university continues to be 7 to 9% over your expected earnings career, etc. The, the problem with this is that it lets society off the hook for paying for the really what the the majority of the value total value of university attendance is and that is non-market indirect and public so students are essentially paying for way too much of the total value um, and <clears throat> we're starting to see the kind of suffocating effects of that in fact we've been seeing that for a long time okay grad student debt uh, is also modeled on the high-paying professions. And again, the idea there is that it, it, people think about doctors and lawyers who if you're going to make $300,000 by the time you're 35 years old, which is about 10 times the median wage in the United States. Sort of like politicians can say to the public, well, I'm not going to ask you as the taxpayer to pay for this person who's making 300 grand a year uh, they're going to have to pay for that themselves. So it's just kind of your $280,000, your $400,000 in medical school debt is basically on you to pay back because you're getting such a huge return that is your return. This is also, it's theoretically flawed for the reasons I just gave. A huge amount of the value of having highly high-end doctors is public. It's spillovers into the public realm. It's also functionally flawed. It's pushing people into high income areas uh, in society and out of lower remuneration areas. So for example, in law, it's encouraging people to go into mergers and acquisitions and not into landlord law, you know, defending people who are getting evicted, which is a national epidemic and there aren't nearly enough lawyers that are willing to help essentially low income people and protect them from that. So we're, we're also, in addition to kind of not asking society to step up and pay for the public good that society is getting, we are also uh, skewing professions and making them uh, moving things into areas that are uh, actually less socially desirable, even if they're more, if they're better paid on a private level. Okay, then when you think about people are getting PhDs or essentially um, tracked to go into education, even if there are alternative careers that people are thinking about now, you're looking at a, at a field that has a high public value and a lower private value. Uh, pay is not so good. It's also precarious. There's also a very high percentage of people that are graduating, as we know, that don't get into longer term stable employment. Mm -hmm. At, le uh, at least for the first few years, if ever. So from my point of view, it's absurd to ask people to take on personal risk for high-risk professions that should essentially be paid for by the public that is massively benefiting from them. Okay, there's a, there's a cultural issue here that actually uh, PhDs in the humanities may be interested in looking into more than we have um, <clears throat> as you know, historians or literature professors or philosophers. And that is, what kind of culture is it that takes um, professions that primarily serve private interests, corporations, for example, in, in, with intellectual property law, and pays them very well, 
and then takes people that serve the public directly. So we're talking about social work, talking about medical aids for the elderly in home care situations, talking about the Department of Motor Vehicles, which we all love more than we ever admit, uh, talking about teachers, preschool, primary, secondary, and tertiary university. Um, what, is, what kind of culture takes people that have high public good value and pays them less, and people that have lower public good value but high private good value pays them more? <laughs> I mean, the simple answer is it's a capitalist society. Uh, but there are also, since people really want the full spectrum of services, uh, and that includes a lot of things you can only get um, through <clears throat> the public sector, uh, it, we could actually start a broader conversation with people about, you know, with our starting with ourselves, but also moving it out to society about what is wrong with our priorities where we ask people who are doing public good activities for their entire lives to take on personal debt to accomplish that. And, you know, on the model of a private good um, sector where the pay is much better. Anyway, you got the point. Uh, I think that we would actually dial back public um, uh, debt require, requirements of debt, taking out debt for public good. And we are already seeing this with uh, the movement that Bernie Sanders helped get on the political map towards free college, debt-free college. Uh, I think we're really at the beginning of a movement towards debt-free, and that I would like to include doctoral students in that. And I would love to see humanities faculty, particularly tenure track faculty, getting involved in starting the discussion for dialing debt for graduate students back to zero.